Hey everybody. Today we will discuss a clinical topic which is approach to an excessively crying infant. This is not just for theory. Again, I'm stressing. You will be seeing these patients in your OPD, in your emergency rooms almost every day or an alternate day. <clears throat> yeah, young baby, harassed mother coming in, completely hassled that the baby is non-stop crying, crying, crying and I don't know what to do. But you need to know what to do. And that is why we are discussing this topic today. See, the percentage of visit by these children in the ER can range anywhere from 0.25 to 13.6%. Even few studies have quoted up to 40%. So it is widely varied depending upon ER from place to place. <clears throat> but you need to know how much does a baby cry normally so that you know what is normal versus what is abnormal. Remember, any baby who is inconsolable is having some abnormality. You need to search for what is the problem. A consolable baby may have a pathological problem and you need to search for it. And you need to identify which baby is a sick baby versus a well baby. A normal infant usually follows this pattern. <clears throat> After two weeks of age, they will progressively start crying more and more and it will reach peak, its peak by around eight weeks, second month. And then slowly reduces by fourth or fifth month. And this crying is usually more in the late afternoon and evenings. All right. And it can be several hours per day. In your infantile colic, you must have read, no, three days a week, three times a day, three hours per day, etc., etc. Yeah. So that is the typical description. And this cry may not be related to hunger, pain, <clears throat> sleep all the time, but it might be. All right. So this is a graph which depicts the different time periods of crying at different ages. A low crier, 20 to 30 minutes, the child can cry in a day, which will peak at two months. Average crier somewhere in between maybe three hours and a high crier up to five to six hours also child can cry. <clears throat> and usually lack of sleep also makes them very irritable, making them cry a lot. At birth, all they eat, all they do is eat, sleep, poop. Correct. So most of the time they spend in sleeping, 16 to 18 hours. By three months, it slightly reduces by an hour or two. By six weeks, after one and a half hours of being awake, they become tired and they will want to go to sleep. By three months, they can hold on this awake period for up to two hours. Then after that, they will go to sleep. There are a lot of mnemonics for why uh, infant can cry unexplained. All right. And it is such a huge list, vast list that it is very difficult for you to remember all the costs. For me, what works is Thinking from head to toe, what could be the causes and to look for them actively. What your mind does not know, your eyes won't see. Okay, If you are comfortable with using mnemonics, you can use that it cries mnemonic where I is for infection, T is for trauma, C is for cardiac, R is for reaction to something or a reflux, I is intersusception, E is for eyes and S is for strangulation. All right. So what I am going to be discussing is <clears throat> what is working for me. All right. Hope it works for you also. This is another classification by system. Okay. Again, if you keep it top to bottom, it is easier for you to remember. You guys can take screenshot of it. I have also provided the references from where I have taken in the bottom. The importance of knowing all these causes is that you need to know what is benign versus what is life-threatening. If you're in a tertiary care center, then you always have people to ask a second, third, multiple opinions of. But if you're in a periphery or in an OPD setup, then you need to identify these life-threatening causes so you can uh, at least refer them to a tertiary care center <clears throat> at the right time. The serious threatening causes that you do not want to miss are from top to bottom, you don't want to miss a meningitis, you don't want to miss an intracranial hemorrhage or maybe a abusive head trauma. Coming down, you don't want to miss, say, um, arrhythmia that is happening or a CCF that is happening to the child. You don't want to miss a child who is hypoxic or who is having a bad pneumonia, hypoxic, and that's why child is crying. You don't want to have a child who is having an intestinal obstruction, malrotation, um, say, a strangulated hernia or a testicular torsion. Correct. So these are all 
some examples of life threatening or serious situations which needs to be addressed fast <clears throat> these are all the situations in which you have to be very very careful and actively look for a uh, organic pathology okay persistent inconsolability sudden increase in frequency or duration of inconsolability say previously child was crying for one hour and it settled down but now child is continuously crying and i'm not knowing what to do for the last two days so that's a red flag child is ill appearing always trust your gut instincts even studies have told doctors instincts that something is not right holds valid okay you you, you you might pick up something. You may not know what it is, but at least you know something is wrong. Okay, so in that case, always admit the child for observation. Even, even if you can't find any cause, if you strongly feel that I, I'm not very comfortable sending this child back home, admit the child. And remember, any child who is persistently crying beyond the period of that initial assessment where you examine, see, any baby is going to cry once you go and touch. <clears throat> That's normal. But if the baby is continuing to cry without being uh, consoled by anything after your initial period of examination, then that is abnormal. Have the child under observation overnight or for the next 24 hours so that you can observe the period, various periods of time. And you will know or you will pick up something that is abnormal. Any child who is not thriving well, any child who is having developmental delay or some neurological abnormality, if you feel there are concerns for trauma, bruises, where there should not be bruises, all right, and you feel this child is having possible trauma, then that's a red flag. <clears throat> and any child who's having a paradoxical crying, child is crying when handled and it resolves when left undisturbed, then that is also a red flag sign. It can, you will know that abnormal cry when you see it and when you feel it. You need to see more patients in order to identify and pick up things early and any abdomen distension tenderness all of these are red flag signs and you need to look for cause if you can't identify at least refer them to a center where they can these non-pathological causes of crying we have already discussed so focus point should be on history 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 and then physical examination investigations only to some extent only will help you Otherwise, it is not going to help you in any way. Most of the investigations will turn out to be normal because most of these pathologies are going to be acute. All right, there no parent is going to sit at home with a child who's crying for four or five days and then come to you. <clears throat> All right, most of them come by at least evening if the child has started crying from morning. So when did it start? How did it evolve? How long is it there? Any trigger points are present? Any feeding behaviors that can initiate this crying? In the past, what has happened? How did the baby deliver, then thrive, feeding patterns? All of that has to be assessed. And you should also ask about the caretaking at home. Who's taking care of the child? How are they managing themselves? All of that is important. And you always, always ask the parent what is most concerning for them. All right. A parent's instinct, again, is very important. And it is as important as a doctor's instinct. Just like how you feel that something is not right, a mother's instinct can tell her that something is not going right with the baby. All right. So always trust the parent, take them into confidence and ask them what is troubling them the most. Is it the crying or is it something else? And most of the time you will get the clue from that history. <clears throat> okay. So these are all other points in history that you will have to focus on. What makes the child calm? What makes the child provoked? Is there something specific that makes the child cry. Say maybe moving this right leg is making the baby cry more. I don't know what to do. The mother might have been changing the diaper. That might give you a clue. Probably the pathology is in the right lower limb somewhere near there. You may not exactly tell, uh -huh, this is septic arthritis of right hip. But at least you know to localize the pathology. Okay, this is where the problem is. And you will look for problems in that area. All right. Then you will ask severity. When is the baby crying most? Is it in the morning? Is it in the evening? Did the child start crying suddenly after, you know, say maybe playing in the garden? And might have bit how will you know? You have to unstrip the baby and completely search for it. <clears throat> and full physical examination is key. All right. Don't say I am not going to look at the diaper area. I am not going to look at the back area. Child is already in so many layers of clothes. No. Ask the mother or father or whichever caregiver has come to you to completely strip the baby. 
All right. You need to do a focused clinical examination of all areas. Again, I'm stressing it is all areas. All right. You can't say I'm not going to look at the diaper area. You might have a diaper dermatitis that is sitting there. How will you know? You might have an anal fissure that is there. How will you know? Unless you examine, you will not be able to identify what the problem is. And if you don't identify, there is no way you can console the caregiver who has come to your OPD. All right. So complete head to toe examination, including physical, including your physical vitals. Okay, never ever miss vital examinations just because you are doing a top to toe examination. All right, probably we will discuss one of these days how to do a initial categorization, physiological categorization of a child who's coming to you so that you can identify them as sick or well. All right, so vital science is basically very important. Any abnormal vital signs, look for an organic pathology. And just look at the general appearance of the child. Is the child arousable? Not arousable. Completely irritable, inconsolable, consolable. Is the child getting, if the child is getting consoled, then what is making the child cry? And is there any specific position in which the child is crying? Maybe child is crying more in lying down position and comfortable when the child is on shoulder. Might point to a reflux. Correct? On lying down, the reflux is worsening and the mother is picking up, the reflux is slightly getting better. All right. And always remember, even though we'll be discussing certain causes of this excessive crying, one point that I would like to tell is, the presence of these things can make the child cry. But absence of certain things also can make the child cry incessantly. Absence of what? Absence of their senses. You have five senses, correct? Your hearing, your vision, taste, touch, etc., etc., so, if the child is not having a hearing, if the child is not having an uh, eyesight, absence of those senses also can make the baby uh, very, very irritable. Okay, so that is something that you will have to keep in mind. <clears throat> so, some specific causes, we'll start with skin because that is the largest surface area and most of the time you will find cause in the surface area. Never forget to look for this hair tonicase syndrome. Okay, so what will happen is this usually happens during this... Um, uh, four months, three and a half to four months period. Why is this specific period? Baby does not do anything. It is the mother. Since she has gone through the significant stress period of delivery and postpartum, they will start having telogen. Telogen effluvium, significant hair loss will be there. So if they are not able to take care of that properly, some hair might get you know wrapped around the small body appendages. It can be finger, it can be toe, it can be anywhere. Okay. Any cylindrical area, basically. And if it gets completely, uh, you know, circumferential and tight, it is going to cut off the blood supply. The distal part is going to become swollen and red. And if you don't identify it, it the foreign body will become, how to tell, encased in the skin. It will become epithelized. All right. Then there is no way to remove it except with surgery. Okay. So you need to identify this. And if you identify this, you will need to send them to a center because depending upon how severe or not severe it is, they will decide whether to do a longitudinal incision and remove the whole thing completely. You have to remove it completely, not in parts and bits and not sure whether something is left out there because it is still a foreign body and it is uh, not nice to leave a foreign body in a baby, right? So, yeah, so most common areas where and all it can happen, toes, fingers, genitalia. Okay, you don't want that part to become ischemic. That's the idea for, of identifying this. Then diaper dermatitis. All right. So diaper dermatitis, you need to identify whether it is irritant or allergic. One. Two, is there a candidal infection or not? Because the treatment is going to differ. If it is just a diaper dermatitis, you can... If it is going to be allergic or irritant, you will ask them to change the type of diaper. You can ask them to switch to cloth diapers and you can um, give topical application of some zinc-based cream. <clears throat> if it is going to be candidal infection, then just zinc is not going to help. You will have to give them an antifungal treatment, correct? You will have to probably use a clotrimazole or something topically to help in relief of the fungal infection. So diaper dermatitis, it's very classical. Location specifically will be in the perineum, buttock, lower abdomen, that wherever the diaper covers basically. What you need to know is irritant dermatitis is more common. Okay. It's a result of maceration of the skin in 
hot and humid closed environment of the diaper. And if you notice those kids, if you open the diaper, you will feel that area is very hot, sweaty, sweaty. Correct. And it's usually in the form of W and it does not involve the folds. This is a very, very important point. Okay. For diaper dermatitis, it does not involve folds. He written diaper dermatitis. All right. So if it is a very, very severe form, that is called as jacket dermatitis. It will form ulceration, punched out ulcers like this. Okay. So you need to be very careful that it does not progress to this level. If it is going to be a, a say, a infective cause like candida, it will involve body foods. Okay. So what we are having here is a irritant dermatitis. So here... If they are using a cloth diapers, they are using some detergents and that is irritating to the skin. On contact with this irritant, the skin will react with erythema, papules, scaling on the most convex surfaces. Meaning that is where the most uh, contact with the irritant is going to be. Otherwise, this child will be well except for the irritability. If it is allergic, secondary to whatever content is there in the diaper, then you will have vesiculation, scaling on the convex surfaces and wherever area of contacts are going to be present. Whatever be the reason, just remove the offending substance. That, is, that will help the child a lot. Then this is allergic contact dermatitis. I hope you are able to make out the vesicles, vesicles part involving all the convex surfaces. And this allergic contact dermatitis can also involve the folds. See, it is confluent, correct? Very, very confluent in the down pictures that you will be able to make out. The previous ones, you are having some clear areas in between. See, your folds are not very much involved. You are able to see this W shape, right? All right. So here in this picture, what you are seeing is a candidal infection. Candidal infection will typically involve your folds, point number one. Then it will have various different shades of red, right? Different shades of something that movie came now. What color I forgot? But gray, black, something like that. So it is different shades of red, basically. That is what you need to remember. And you will have a lot of satellite lesions. Okay, so this is very characteristic. Involvement of folds, satellite lesion is equal to candidal dermatitis. All right. And whenever you are asking the parents to apply any sort of antifungal cream, you need to ask them to apply at least an inch outside of the spreading border. Say, suppose only this much uh, is the candidal infection. You should ask them to apply it till this area because it spreads like that. All right. So this is classical of candidal infection. Other skin points to look for perineal excoriation if there is a lactose intolerance. Suppose baby is on cow's milk. They can have cow's milk protein allergy. You can ask them for spots of blood, crying after immediately feeding, right? And if they pass very gassy, very, um, how to tell, forceful stools, acidic stools, then you will have a lot of perianal excoriation and you can look for this lactose intolerance point. There can be some eczematous lesions. Some children will have atopic dermatitis. This picture represents atopic dermatitis. Okay, they will have irritability, fussiness, increased crying, lot of pruritus will be present. The pruritus is what is going to cause them a lot of discomfort. And interestingly, some studies have shown that in an uh, you know, excessively crying child, immediately you may not be able to find anything. But when they took up these atopic dermatitis children and they looked back into the history, there was more crying in those children at younger ages than other kids, even though they did not have skin lesions. Okay, and other things that you should look for is any cellulitis, burns, any insect bites, small ants, mosquitoes, all of that will be red, swollen, and it will be intensely itching. And that is very irritating for the baby and they cry. And always remember, infant who can't bruise should not bruise. Okay, you cannot have a child who is four months, uh, not yet learned to turn over and the child is having bruises in thighs, bruises in arms, some unusual locations. All right. So these are all the concerning bruises for non-accidental injury. Put this in your head. You should never miss a non-accidental injury. Okay. So what are all the cutaneous injuries that are suspicious? In, in a pre-cruising infant, meaning before starting to cruise, this infant is having any bruising, any burn marks, 
some oral injuries, subconjunctival hemorrhages that are not related to birth. Most of the subconjunctival hemorrhages resolve by six weeks. Okay, so if you're having a subconjunctival hemorrhage in a three-month-old child, then that's not normal. We need to look for why that is happening. In a cruising infant, in the 10-4 phases P distribution, this is a mnemonic that you can very well afford to remember. If you. 10 is trunk, ears, neck. Okay, any bruising in the trunk, ear and neck region. 4 is for infants 4 months and younger with any bruise anywhere. Faces, it's not just the face of the baby. What they mean is the frenulum, angle of the jaw. C is for cheeks, E is for eyelids, S is for subconjunctival region and P is for patterned bruising. Okay, pattern of a belt, pattern of anything basically a rope whatever it is if it's a pattern bruising then it is not normal so if any of these are there then you need to alert concerned authorities immediately and escalate to your higher people because this is definitely a non-accidental injury suspicious situation and you don't want to handle it alone okay so skin we have completed correct huh? next we will look at top to bottom head Fontanel. Fontanel, try to examine the child in a sitting situation and hopefully preferably when the child is more calm. Okay. See if it is sunken. Is it concerning for dehydration, especially in a child who is not gaining weight? Might have had few episodes of vomiting. All right. Unlikely loose tools. So if something is there, then probably dehydration. Feed the baby reasses. If it is bulging, then that is concerning for increased intracranial pressure. What is this intracranial pressure secondary to? Is it an infection? Is it a bleed? Is it something else? Is there a progressively increase in head size? All of these will give you a clue. Okay. So meningitis is one of the situations where we talked about paradoxical irritability. Okay. Usually when the mother picks up the child, the child usually gets consoled. Usually. But if the crying is made worse when holding and trying to console, that's a paradoxical irritability. One of the situations where you will see that is meningitis. Okay, then you will also look for the tone of the baby. Is there hypertonicity, hypotonicity? All right, all of this will give a clue to a neurological underlying disorder. Why is that important? Especially when you are going to the chest part and respiratory system examination, this child might be hypoxic without having tachypnea. That is the significance of doing a neurological examination also. In a neuromuscular disease child, even with bad full white out lungs, they may hardly breathe because they're not having the muscle strength to mount a fast breathing response. But this child will be hypoxic and consistently crying in a very weak voice. Right? All right. So, head touch. Uh, then E, eyes. Eyes are corneal abrasion. Okay. So, see, they, their nails will be very difficult to cut. Okay. Some sharp points might be there. And... It's a superficial lesion in the corneal epithelium, but it might irritate the child. You look for redness, excessive tearing in that particular eye, blepharospasm and photophobia. Okay, so how do you identify it? You can do a fluorescein dye plus topical anesthesia. Why? Because topical anesthesia will relieve the pain. Fluorescein dye will show you where this scratch is. So it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. But remember, just because you find a corneal abrasion does not mean that is the only cause. And don't relax thinking, aha, I have found out a cause in a child who is excessively crying. Okay, Because 50% of them can have a corneal aberration without having this excessive cry. Okay, So don't run behind one cause. Always look for everything else also. A glaucoma usually gets diagnosed in the newborn period. But again, you will be able to pick up because one eye is definitely going to be bigger than the other. All right, and this should not be missed because it needs to be addressed immediately. Otherwise, the child will lose the eyesight. Kannach. Next, ears. Ears and oropharynx, what are you going to look for? Ear, look for redness. If you touch the ear, child is starting to cry. Any bruising is there. Bruising we have already discussed. Always do a otoscopic examination. Okay, especially in a child, common situation you will see is a child who just started having runny nose in the morning, evening child is coming, crying, 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 crying. The nose might be completely blocked. Okay, there can be a retraction of tympanic membrane, some redness or otitis media in the tympanic membrane. All of these will irritate the child. Okay, so clear the nose, do a otoscopic examination and look after serum and removal to see what is happening to the tympanic membrane. All right, that is important. And always, always don't forget to look for a foreign body, especially if the child has an older sibling. 
Okay, many a times we have found very, very interesting stuff in young infants, like six to eight months of age with an older sibling. You, I, we have found puri parts, puri, you know, eating puri, beads, right? Small, small Legos. You can find many interesting stuff. But what I am trying to stress is never forget to look into the ear. Oral examination, you will look for ulcers and erosions basically. All right. So this is called as bednar afte. So these are infected wounds which are in the hard palate. Okay, this is because of an incorrect feeding technique. And most of the time, it resolves itself if you correct the feeding technique and show them the right position. If it is uncorrected, it is painful for both the baby and the mother. And last but not least, teething is something that you should not forget. Okay, they it will lead to increased crying, irritability, some amount of biting, biting, sucking, sucking. All right, the symptomatic management will most of the time settle these babies down. So, H E E N T finished. Next, lower down, you have cardiovascular system. Two things you should not miss is a CCF and a arrhythmia. All right, CCF can be due to a congenital problem or an acquired problem. Congenital problems like your any shunt lesions, it may not manifest at birth because of the elevated pulmonary pressures by Say one to two weeks, you will have your PDA manifest and by around six to eight weeks, you will have your bigger left to right shunts like your VSD manifest. Okay, because that is when your pressure start coming down. Uh, Alkappa is something that can present like this. Myocarditis is an acquired problem that can present as CCF. They will tell this child had some non-specific, uh, uh, you know, a little bit some running also there. Some maybe plus or minus fever was present and the child is not been feeding that well, irritable on and off, child has started vomiting and when you examine, they will have all signs of CCF. Okay, but never miss this, that is important. Arrhythmia, any heart rate more than 220 is an abnormal sign. Okay, to underline it and keep it. Okay, it is not normal and connect a ECG lead, try to look for it. Actively look for P waves, Actively look for the narrow QRS complexes and the non-variability. Okay. So this, again, I think you can take a screenshot and go through this. This is what we have discussed. And I have put up a table to tell you guys how to identify each of these things. Next, the respiratory system. Nasal block. Common things are common. Okay. Don't poke something inside the nose before you see with your eyes first. Okay. So nasal block. Remove the nasal block. If the child is having fast breathing, grunting, low saturations, then there is something in the lung parenchyma. It can be secondary to an infection. It can be secondary to heart, causing backlog of fluid. All right, but abnormal. Okay, this child is having a pathology. And neuromuscular disease patient, we have already discussed. A child who is having fast breathing without distress, fever is something you have to look for. Metabolic acidosis will be second cause. In a child who is not well thriving, who's breathing fast without distress is probably having a metabolic acidosis, which can be secondary to say, for example, a RTA. Okay, you should not miss that. All right. And fever, yes, you will look for it. But remember, even in a, yeah, a young child who's having a very serious infection, they may not have a fever response. They can come to you with hypothermia. I think people who practice newborn will know that um, very well. All right, young infants also behave very similarly. They may not mount a fever response. It's just because fever is not there, don't rule out an infection. Okay, so talk to bottom, look for airway obstruction. It can be just nasal discharge and obstruction or it can be a foreign body. Lower down, upper airway obstruction like a croup. Lower respiratory infection, pneumonia. They will present with fast breathing, grunting, low saturation. You can hear crepitations, crackles, wheeze, etc. Trauma, unlikely... Generally, unless it is a non-accidental injury, basically abuse. Okay, so chest part, we have completed CVS and RS. Correct. Going down below, GIT, colic. Okay, colic, I think all of you know. Right? Young infant who is having more crying during the evening, maybe lasts for around three hours. Different babies get different techniques. work. Some babies become calmer when they go out. Some babies become calmer when they rock your um, cymatocone and all that it helps in some does not help in some but usually resolves after four to five months all right two to three months is when it peaks never miss a obstruction that is what you should know 
any child who is having an abdominal distension vomiting always look for bilious vomiting by look i mean the child may not vomit in front of you but the parents might have brought clothes from home the um, or rags from uh, home that they used to clean up the vomit right it can have that leaf green bile print or they can have some drops of the bilious vomit on the dress that they are wearing i will still remember a child whom i picked up in my post graduation days because this child came with nothing except some on and off irritable cry okay that's it otherwise child was okay in between child was okay when the child came to us in the middle of the night the child was actually looking okay all right i kept on asking them what was wrong the parents and uh, the grandparents said child is crying that's it nothing else child had pooped child had peed child had fed child had one episode of vomiting child was crying now the child looked comfortable examination also was looking normal but why did the child cry na i was not able to make out then looking at the shirt of the child there were some few splatters of green that did not look like it belonged with the pattern or rest of the shirt then when asked they specifically told ha 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 one end of the vomiting was looking like this then when we did an ultrasound we picked up an intersection so key is observation okay before undressing look at the dress of the child after undressing look at the baby so valvulus intersusception all of those should not be missed as per reflux history whether the child is comfortable on shoulders more irritable when lying down specifically maybe the mother might be uh, doing a breast feeding and um, mixed feeding say with a you know cow's milk or formula or whatever and child is more irritable after taking that compared to breast milk okay and always always look to see if the baby is thriving well a well thriving baby lesser chances of a very serious long standing pathology okay so in a child who is not thriving well with reflux then you will have to assess to see if this reflux is what is causing the uh, baby to not gain weight then it becomes a reflux disease and any reflux disease needs to be addressed the stooling pattern you should ask whether they are seeing blood in stools how is the blood streaks of blood splatters of blood okay and always look for anal fissures in the child how smell protein allergy we have discussed again it is the same thing put in a, um, a table format for you guys to go through it so gut tell us this is done and always examine the abdomen for any masses okay that is something i have not put in the presentation but i am telling you guys okay you will always have to look for any mass per abdomen okay because neuroblastoma wilms tumor all of this can present at this age okay and they can manifest with irritability mind you then genito urinary infection you look for it's not just infection genito urinary region you look for hernia and you look for features of obstruction strangulation in those you look at the testes in a male child for testicular torsion okay because again that needs to be addressed as early as possible uti you look for it if you have rolled other causes and there are some soft markers like maybe a little bit of redness around the um, you know penile region child is crying while passing urine is a very common complaint you cannot attribute it to just uti all right you can do a urine examination but many studies have shown that it is not very specific meaning crying excessive crying and uti all right musculoskeletal system always always look for fractures okay ask the parent is the child moving any limbs less or is the child crying more when you are trying to move that limb you also observe to see whether all four limbs are moving easily comfortably without restriction any limb which is having a restricted movement is the abnormal limb young infants you can do a moro reflex to see if it is symmetrical all right there can be a fracture there can be a septic arthritis these are two things you should actively look for in a child who is having reduced movement of one specific limb again this is in a tabular format you can go through take a screenshot and go through these things some um, miscellaneous causes inborn errors of metabolism you should look for in a child who is not thriving well some non specific few vomiting lethargy irritability lethargy irritability combination then look for iam look for metabolic acidosis send a lactate ammonia look for sugars all of those has to be done everything is okay except for this irritability lethargy in this child see if there is sepsis admit the child do a basic evaluation never miss that sickle cell crisis 
is something that you will have to look for, especially a family history can give you a clue that this might be possible. And non-accidental injury has to be ruled out. Okay. So if you have ruled out all of this, nothing is uh, looking like a life-threatening problem, you can advise rest to baby and mother. Rest is not just putting up your uh, leg in a recliner chair and sleeping. Rest for infants will be regulation, meaning reading cues trying to feed the baby before the baby goes to the crying stage of hunger. Entrainment is synchronizing infant behavior with other environmental stimuli like light, noise, just when the child is, you know, yawning well, wanting to go to sleep, you put on a rock music, then that is not right. Then structure, try to balance a routine. You need not stick to it very uh, strictly, but try to maintain a routine. And always use soothing techniques like holding or rocking. Soothing helps. Rest for parents also is important because most of the time the parents and the caregivers are very tired, especially if the child has been crying, crying, crying overnight, multiple days. So you need to give them R, reassurance, E, empathy. S is support from the healthcare provider. And T is time out for the parents. You need to ask them to step out and somebody else to step in so that these people can rejuvenate and come back. This rest intervention has decreased stress in both parent and it has decreased stress for the infant also. They cry less. All right. Hope this will at least help you to organize your thought process for a child who's coming to your OPD or ER with excessive crying and we should not miss any serious causes. Okay. Thank you.